Welcome to Writer's Life, an ongoing conversation with writers, authors, and folks in the publishing industry. I'm your host, Marvel Harrison, Publishing Director, Members Press of Western New Mexico University. It is a pleasure to share a conversation today with Nina Burley, an award-winning journalist and New York Times best-selling author of seven lively, acclaimed works of creative nonfiction. Nina is a political and investigative journalist reporting from all corners of the globe. Welcome to Writer's Life, Nina. Thanks. I'm thrilled to be here, Marvel. You know, you've had such an inspiring writing career as a journalist, an author, an investigative reporter. You know, how did how did you become a writer? And maybe more importantly, how did your writing career develop to include such a broad scope of work? Well, that's a big question that could take up. How much time do we have? Uh, you might no, it's a conversation. We'll... You might not have to answer, ask me another question. Um, well, that's fine. So, okay. Well, I'll start with, um, I was born in Chicago um, to two writers. My dad um, has written dozens of children's books and also is a poet. And my mom hasn't published a lot, but she has loves to write and is a terrific reader. And she started, you know, reading us over and over and over again, the great nursery rhymes and then fairy tales and, you know, all the, all the children's books, um, you know, over and over again. And I learned to read. I still remember the day that I learned to read and understand decode letters um, you know, Dick and Jane books, a uh, little school, you know, public school in Chicago. Right. I was five and I still remember coming home. So thrilled because I finally understood, you know, what, what she was doing and, you know, dad too was reading to us and what dad was doing, always scribbling in his notebook and, you know, what those symbols meant. Um, so it was in my head, um, you know, the lyr- lyricism of, of nursery rhymes and, and then when I was a little older, poetry, um, one of the things that uh, we did, my family moved quite a bit when I was young. They were kind of itinerant pedagogues, I guess. And they, we lived in San Francisco after Chicago. We lived in San Francisco. Then we lived in Michigan um, and then in suburban Chicago again. And we spent a summer in Baghdad because my mother is an Assyrian from Iraq. So when I was eight, I lived in Iraq and, uh, I spent a lot of time reading. Once I learned how to read, um, books were kind of my, um, my refuge and my private world and my, you know, my soul really was in, in these, um, you know, in between the covers of books. And so I was a big reader um, and, um, and I was a writer. And I started writing when I was, started writing short, short stories um, probably when I was in third grade or fourth grade. And, um, you know, along the way there were English teachers and well, teachers, grade school teachers and, um, and other people who were encouraging. I still remember a, um, I was in 4-H in Michigan. I grew up, that was one one of our, one of our lives was living among Amish people in, um, in Southern Michigan. And uh, my parents didn't want us to have TV. They didn't want us to get addicted to TV. So they, we had it for a while and then they locked it up in a closet or something. And so I, they were a little ahead of the curve. They were, I guess. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess you can say that <laughs> they didn't want us to have t- too much TV. So we would go to the library every Saturday. We lived on a farm and we would go to the library in town every Saturday. And I would just check out heaps of books and just read and sit in the, in the, um, uh, in the cold drafty old farmhouse with a blanket next to the heating sources and just read all winter. And, um, and in 4-H, there was, incredible to think about it now, there was a woman who decided to um, have a creative writing class. And so in 4-H, uh, we would go on you know, winter afternoons on the school bus, we would jump off at her house and she would have this table 
uh, her kitchen table laid out with just cut out pictures from magazines. And she would say, okay, pick, pick a couple pictures and write a story about what is in the pictures. You know, just, they were just pictures from like advertising, color pictures of families or people, people walking down city streets or, and, uh, so we, you know, we were encouraged to just use our imaginations. And that was a really important uh, piece of my education. And I had kind of forgotten about it until her, one of her sons was looking through some old material. And this was a couple of years ago. And he sent me this little yellow envelope with these stories that we had all written. And it was amazing. It was like with his first story, first story, we wrote it together and it was about, the world in 2010 or something. And we imagined it having been taken over by, by um, giant worms. And I was really into science fiction then. So anyway, in 2010 didn't seem like a time that would ever occur. And, you know, just anyway, so, so creativity, a lot of writing early on, encouraged by a lot of people who, for, to whom I'm very grateful. And then from that, from there on, I went to college um, still loved reading, um, got an English degree, um, thought I was going to write the great American novel, was working as a waitress my senior year in central Illinois in a, in a little college town. And my, one of my professors said, you know, there's this program in Springfield, Illinois, which was just down the road a piece at state capitol. And if you, you, if you get accepted, you will be, um, trained as a journalist and you will get to intern at one of the um the state house bureaus so at that time the state house in illinois had associated press chicago tribune chicago sun times all of these small town papers that had enough you know from larger i shouldn't say small town medium-sized town towns in the state of illinois had bureaus there so i got into the program i got into the associated and I started covering and writing about um, state government politics, you know, and this was, you know, big time Chicago politics and a lot of corruption and a how lot old, of. How old were you then? Well, I was 20. Okay. Oh, no, I was, you know, just graduated from college. So what is that? 21, yeah, okay. um, 21, 22. And so I did this program and I just got completely addicted to journalism <laughs> and, 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 you know, the smell of corruption and, tra and tracking down, you know, um, blowhards and hypocrites. And, and, and it was the year after, um, this will date me, but it was the year after the ERA finally died, the Equal Rights Amendment. It, it had died in Illinois. Phyllis Schlafly was living in, was from Illinois. And Phyllis Schlafly had mounted this war against more liberal women from, of course, Chicago. And the people in the press room there still remembered women chaining themselves to the rotunda to protest what was about to happen. So, you know, early on, quite interested, of course, in women's rights issues, not just because of that, but so I, I got into political reporting and writing there. And in those days, I was, you know, I had traveled, obviously, my parents had dragged us all over the place, but I wasn't a big traveler um, myself. And I didn't have deep pockets to go traipsing around the world. But I, I told all my colleagues, you know, I'm going to go to Africa and I'm just going to be like Hemingway. I'm going to, I'm going to travel the world and I'm going to start in Africa. So it was kind of like the big joke, like you're in Springfield, Illinois. And they would give me like, you know, I still remember them giving me this like big Atlas of Africa. Like, you know, here are our, our young journalist is going to go and be the intrepid, you know, female Hemingway. And so I dreamed that I was going to do that for a long time. But I, I really had no way of getting out. I had no money. I was paying off student loans. And I worked as a journalist for a while, and many, well, what, three or four years in Illinois. And then I went back to grad school at the University of Chicago, got a master's in 17th century literature. Um, you know, again, a intensive reading. And I think that program really made me, we would sometimes read seven books a week. I mean, it was an intense intense you know um you know these they were training people to be critics and to be professors and that was not the road i was going to take but i i learned then how to edit how to close read and edit um and 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 focus on writing in a, in a way that probably i wouldn't have had so that made me able to edit my own work and later when i started writing books 
I had the this kind of background in in re in close reading, and so I had a different kind of education in in writing and reading from that than I was getting on the on the job in journalism. And then I graduated and I went back into journalism, back into into writing for the public. Um, and, you know, I started freelancing at a certain point because I wanted to be able to travel. And I started traveling or people getting people to send me to places in the US. Um, I went out to California a couple of times, did, did some stories out there, did some stories in Wyoming. I still remember going to doing a big piece on the rodeo um out there and and a lot of a lot of us traveling and then i got into covering arkansas when clinton was running for president i was in arkansas a lot for people magazine and time magazine i was stringing for them out of chicago and then i got sent to washington and from there the world really opened up because washington is such an international city and there i started meeting people who literally really were coming my roommate and now one of my best dearest oldest friends had literally just hitchhiked now she speaks six languages and grew up in belgium but she had literally hitchhiked from mali to joburg over a 6 month period so here i met someone who actually was doing that kind of thing and i would not i was never intrepid enough to do that kind of that crazy thing, but I did end up eventually getting to a lot of Northern Africa, um, covering the Middle East, and then even Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, Nina, what strikes me about your story is you had sort of embedded, it's almost like writing was in your blood. You it know, was you a blood. genetic Absolutely. precursor. You had these fabulous um, opportunities in terms of all of the reading that was encouraged, it reminds me of how important programs like Reach Out and Read, a pediatric a pediatrician's program nationwide, where they actually read to kids at a well child clinic. I mean, like- Profoundly to, important. Yes. The and, then that, and then that 4-H woman, I mean, yep. who jumps off a bus in the middle of cold freezing Michigan and, and, and starts a creative writing program off of a, a bunch of pullouts of a magazine, you know, on a kitchen like, table, right? Yeah. You never know. I mean, it's like a moment of touching another spirit really can impact their life in Absolutely. incredible yeah. ways. And I think the thing that strikes me most about your writing is how gutsy you are. You thank you for saying that I'm not, you know, I was, you know, I, I, I had an image of myself as being very brave. Um, uh, and I projected that, but I actually um, was not. And and I don't really consider myself to be brave, sometimes foolhardy, but not, you know, it takes a lot of um, internal um, angst to face up to some things. I'm really not a very, um, for example, a very, uh, how to put this, I'm, I'm not as extroverted as I, as I think I probably come off and I have, had a lot of time, uh, a lot of difficulty sometimes interviewing people um, or not interviewing. I mean, once I'm in the room with, you know, powerful, important person, I can do it, but I'm, I'm never not, I'm never not intimidated. Right. I fight that back every time. I think about, you know, your latest book, Virus. And I mean, the first chapter, it's called Smash the State. And you do exactly that within the first few pages. And I think about how, from an investigative reporting standpoint, you immerse yourself in the subject. And I find that very admirable. It's not like you're reporting from outside and taking information in and putting it out there. You're actually immersing oneself in it. And I, I just think that's incredible, especially because of some of the vile places you've had to travel or go and i don't mean physic geographically i mean in terms of people well yeah i mean i, I guess that probably goes the the my you know if it, if it looks like i'm doing that it goes back to illinois and that having to be on the front lines there in that in that state house right. um first of all understanding how um, power is, um, is gotten and maintained and wielded. And that's, that was a lesson there that I learned, um, in those committee hearings and watching, you know, 
um, the House Speaker steamroll everybody to, you know, to get their way and, and you know, um, the money powers in Chicago versus the conservative Republican so- out, outside in the farmland, right. um, very, you know, varying interest groups, the power of interest groups and, and how bureaucracies work and how government works. And that, that was a lesson that I took and used all over the world. You know, I, I used it, I've covered trials in Israel and I've covered trials in Italy um, I've covered, you know, government people in other countries. And of course, the systems are different, vastly different. Um, the Italian court system is not like ours. Um, the uh, Israeli system, not like ours. But in the end, the front facing agencies and offices um, are in, you know, they're inhabited by human beings and people have organized themselves in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Um, Even when you're not in a functioning democracy, there still are certain things that are going on that you can have that having worked in that place early on in Springfield, Illinois, and seen up front how people try to organize themselves. You know, I use that um, always when I was, you know, covering those bigger stories. Um, And, you know, as you said, I mean, yes, I've embedded myself with vileness. I mean, I'm not a war correspondent. I don't Mm-hmm. I, again, you know, you're, you, to you, I, you're, you say that I seem quite intrepid, and, and, but I'm, I have done a tiny bit of war reporting. Um, I was in Baghdad after the first Gulf War, right immediately after one of the first journalists going in there of those who weren't already embedded. And then I've been in other places where, you know, Egypt after the revolution, where there were bloody melees breaking out around me. And I don't like that stuff at all. And I, I don't, whenever I'm in it, I'm like, I understand that I'm here for my job and I cannot wait to get out of here. And if I die here, I really do believe in the first amendment and the importance of informing people, but I don't think it, I, it's never been, I've never been somebody who thought, you know, my life is worth sharing this, these horrors that are happening in the world. Now I admire deeply people who are, and I have friends who are, who embed themselves and witness suffering up close, like people who have gone out to, let's say, interview the Syrian refugees, women and Yazidis who were um, just so, uh, I mean, the, the horrors that have been visited on on people in this world. And, and I can't imagine sitting with them day after day, the way some writers have and, and, and channeling that. I just don't have, I'm too permeable. And I don't know how other people do it. I, I know a lot of war correspondents and I know what they what they do. And I know people who have done that, but I'm not, I'm not quite at that. I, I'm, I'm way too permeable for that. And yeah. I, I think it would da- have damaged me utterly. And I do like to have my, my, you know, I have family and a husband and kids and, and a house and, and, and that's important to me too, um, to have a place to go and retreat to and, and be still. You know, I think about, um, uh, Richard Ben Kramer was an investigative reporter, Pulitzer Prize winning writer, who ended up writing probably the definitive book on uh, Joe DiMaggio, the biography. And, you know, he once told me about, you know, how embedded he got that he couldn't separate himself and how destructive it was. So your awareness of that, your awareness of, you know, that you can't do that or you won't or uh, whatever the words are. I mean, that's that's important. That's that piece about a writer knowing themselves well enough to know where they can go and where they can't. And I don't mean places, I mean, in terms of process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, I definitely know myself well enough to know that I can't. I mean, I've had, as I said, I've dipped my toe into that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I've covered school or, you know, gun massacres and I once and I will not I will not do it again. I just can't. I can't do it. Um, I can't do it. And I, I you know, I, I read about them, but I to go in and um, and talk to the surviving families um, and then to share that I, you know, I just can't be the vessel for that. I think that you have this great courage around calling um, truth to power. And I mean, even in this country, I mean, it's one thing to talk about other places, but to really 
you know, be honest and reflective politically here about what happens. And I think you do that very well. And I appreciate it as an audience for someone who's willing to, to step out and do that kind of work. Well, thank you for saying that because I do, that is something that matters a lot to me. Um, hypocrisy, uh, abuse of power, um, you know, uh, corruption, um, hypocrisy, misinformation, disinformation, misleading people, taking advantage of people who are maybe not educated or uh, have the access that we do, um, you know, fooling them. It, it, it just, it, it makes me sick and it makes me angry. And that I think is, you know, it's a channel that I have. I am, I am fortunate to have access to some of these venues where I can publish that kind of writing. Well, you are very important to me. You have published in every major magazine and, and journal in the, I, I mean, in terms of politically and in the popular press, there is, I mean, I don't even begin to want to run off all of the, the well, I've been around for a long time <laughs> and I'm still standing. <laughs> still and, standing. Uh, you know, it is, it's important, you know, we need to, uh, we need to use those, you know, what we have that these, these places, these, me- I mean, megaphones that, you know, anybody who has access to the media, it's really our duty, I think, to do this, to call out, um, you know, lies, and hypocrisy, and misleading um, information, and, and, you know, the smash the state quote, uh, that's a quote, the title of that chapter, mm-hmm. it's a quote from Steve Bannon, um, who is, um, hopefully at this moment, uh, very afraid of being put in jail and convicted for finally convicted for, for his misdeeds. Um, but, uh, you know, in our, in my time covering American politics, um, the last five years or six now, six, seven years, I guess, have just been unprecedented in the um, bashing of norms and the you know the the rise of this minority, this fanatical minority um, that was held in check by norms and by people who be- believed in following the rules that we were taught and the rules that I was taught of covering government and and you know in in Illinois back in the day where you, there were certain things that you expected people to do even if they were corrupt you expected them to be trying to hide it. Um, and, you know, in the Trump years, um, every single day, there was some outrage and some breaking of norms or some act of incredible uh, corruption and, and um, venality that would have entailed uh, weeks of investigation and a Pulitzer Prize in, in, you know, in years before. And it was just an avalanche. Of, um, of impunity. And we have lived through the years of this avalanche of impunity of smashing the state, which is what Steve Bannon, you know, the revolutionary on the right. These are fascist revolutionaries and they've come in from the right. And I'm not saying that this country wasn't due for a revolution because there've been, you know, the mishandling of money at the federal level and the, fe- the way the federal government has ignored the problems of the, you know, people between here and California. Um, you know, t- small towns boarded up. The ones I lived in when I was a kid boarded up, filled with people, hopeless people on opioids. Yeah, there needed to be a revolution, but it's unfortunate that the revolution is coming from the right. And the, the outcome of this is not going to be pretty if there isn't, you know, a wall put up and, and uh, the right thinking majority of Americans go to the polls and try to um, re- reclaim the um the spirit of the of the country really well that part and i'm glad to hear you say about the norms because so many things that were um broken were not legislated or legal or not they were the norms of 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 appropriate behavior and that's what's so disgusting and i think what you described about the people who get used and abused. I mean, those are the vulnerable people in our world. And yes. 
Yes, they've been, you know, they've been there. There's a lot of vulnerable people in the world. There are a lot of, you know, there's massive wealth inequality that has, again, evolved over my time and mm-hmm. our time on, mm-hmm. on earth. You know, this is something that's been happening since our childhood. And, and it's now reached this proportion where we don't, we don't see a way to get around it on yeah. um, power. You know, the powerful have, have, you know, set up the system so that there is more power to the powerful and more money to the already moneyed and, and uh, we need leaders. And anyway, that's, I don't mean to be preaching to the choir um, back to the writing, you know, issue. I mean, I, after the Trump years, um, I was a little, well, the pandemic started um, and I've been doing some other things. I'm not quite as enmeshed in Paul in covering and writing about the political system. Um, trying to focus on, again, you know, culture and um, the things in the world that are good. And I'm not saying that we have to write happy news, but um, I, for my own mental health, think that it's worth spending some time thinking about the things that we do have that are really good. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, So I've been traveling a lot and seen some beautiful places and we've been writing about beautiful places. I was just in Spain, Moorish Spain for the New York Times. Um, And that was a wonderful trip. Um, Looking at history, 700 years of, of, uh, of Moorish control of, of the Iberian Peninsula. That's a lot of years, longer than the United States has been a country. Spain was ruled by these you know, Middle Eastern people who came up that very short, straight crossed the water takes an hour to get from Morocco to Spain, less than an hour and on a fast ferry and ruled the, ruled the uh, peninsula and went through a lot of changes. And they left this incredible architecture and incredible art and the language of Spain, of Spain is filled with these Arabic words. And they left a culture behind and for a time that civilization was the center of culture in Europe and they were tolerant, but, you know, time passed and rigid rulers came in and religious fanaticism came in and, and religious fanaticism from the other side. And it's, you know, I had, maybe, maybe we took too many lessons. <laughs> yeah, maybe, <laughs> you know, I know we need to wind down and, you know, any, any words that you would uh, add to writers who need a little boost in the direction of of how you make a world out of writing? Well, um, you know, first of all, when you're young, read, 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 um, take notes, uh, keep a journal. I didn't. I've done it off and on through my life, and I wish I'd kept it up more when I wasn't doing it. Um, take, you know, seize all opportunities. Nothing is too small. I started out writing for the women's calendar of the Chicago Tribune for a while, writing like about events. Um, So, you know, tiny, tiny places that, you know, starting points when you don't, Mm -hmm. don't think that anything is too small to, Mm -hmm. as a starting point, keep your eye on the distant prize, Um, seize an opportunity when you see it. Um, and also, you know, a, a little bit about the topics, like I, I do, I have covered politics and it's passion is speaking truth to power, obviously, but I have a broad range of interests, environment, um, gender, culture, um, travel, um, and, and my books, uh, reflect that. And I've been very lucky to be able to be a generalist, um, not an easy uh, not a, not an e- easily commercially marketable way to go about things, um, but uh, follow your curiosity. So keep your eyes open. Okay. Well, it has been a pleasure, pleasure to speak with you today, Nina. And thanks to everyone who's joined us. I'm Marvel Harrison, and from all of us at Members Press, may your day be sparked with that necessary curiosity and wonder and see you again on the next Writer's Life.